Welcome back, everyone, to Aspire, the Leadership Development Podcast, where we will be discussing the visions, inspirations, and experiences from top educational leaders. My name is Joshua Stamper, and you can connect with me on Twitter or on Instagram at Joshua double underscore Stamper. Welcome back, everyone, to the Aspire Mailbag. And I can't believe this, but this is the 19th Aspire Mailbag with my amazing friend, the COO of Teach Better, Jeff Gargas. Thanks, buddy, for being here for the 19th episode. 19 sounds like a lot, except for when, Josh, just earlier, just before I got on here, I was engaged in a Facebook comments back and forth and stuff amongst people that, a bunch of people that I graduated high school with. Mm-hmm. So I put on our last, our last reunion. So like now when like someone tagged me, I was like, Hey, does anybody know when our reunions happen? Because this year is 20 years out for me. It's so like 19 episodes sounds long, but not anything compared to the fact that I've been out of high school for 20 years. I'm oh, like, crazy. I know you've been out longer. <laughs> But like for me, that's still a lot. <laughs> I, I'm trying to do the math in my head, but yes, it's longer. Well, I didn't realize until they said it. I'm like, oh, but here's the, it was crazy. So like when we did our 10 year, like it didn't happen. It wasn't supposed to be like our class president kind of like disappeared. Mm-hmm. So like our 10 year didn't happen. And like it was in their 11th year when like we realized that. And I'm like, oh, there was a couple of us. I'm like, well, let's put it together. So we put it together. We actually did 12 years. So my whole thing this year, I'm like, hey, we're going to do a 20, 21 year. We did a 12 year, we're going to do a 21 year, and then we'll do like a, like a 33 year or something. We're going to just never be normal. So, but yeah, I had that like realization or just, just before we got on here, I'm like, wow, I've been out of high school for 20 years. Like, it's great. Like you just don't No. You don't feel like, right? No, so, not at all. It's going to be 20 years here soon for me graduating college. So that's insane to me. Wow. Yeah. You're a lot older than me. I know. I'm, we're, we're getting made fun of right now by our I know. Guests. Like she's. She can't even she's, stay quiet in the background. She, she mutes herself because she's <laughs> laughing so much right now. That's the problem right now. So Yeah. I'm, I'm glad this is not a video. Right now. Actually, the video would have been really good to capture, honestly, because she's just like losing it, bouncing around over there, laughing. She can be off mute now. This, yeah, you can unmute. Guess. Come on in. Hedrick Nichols, amazing podcaster, YouTuber, author. She does it all. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Love you guys. Josh, Jeff, great to be here. Yeah, she's she's controlled right now. She she got all, all her laughter out. But <laughs> Hedrick, for those who haven't, you know, listened to the amazing episode that you did not too long ago on the Aspire podcast, can you just share, you know, what you do in education and then a little bit about your side projects? Uh, yes, I am a curriculum writer and a lead district lead for EdTech in middle school in a North Texas public charter right behind Cowboy Stadium. And I am the author of two recently released Cherry Lake Publishing books, What is Anti-Racism and What is Black Lives Matter. I'm super excited about those. And I am the host, as you said, of Small Bites, which is an equity series for uh, YouTube and for podcasts, wherever you hear your podcasts. And it talks all about kind of hands-on strategies for how to be a more cultural, culturally responsible and responsive educator. That's awesome. And Hedrick is a part of the Teach Better Podcast Network, and we're just so thrilled to have you a part of that team. You bring so much amazing content, and um, I just appreciate you being here. Also, to join in the fun of answering these amazing leadership questions. We just like raise the bar a little bit here for, for everybody tonight. That's Ooh, I'm looking for. That's, that's definitely <laughs> happening. So for those who may not have listened, we reached out to you, the listeners, to ask for leadership questions via Twitter, Instagram, and Boxer. And in the past episodes, we've answered anywhere from three to five leadership questions. And tonight, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to answer three questions from folks that have reached out to us. And so if you guys are ready, we're going to jump into our first question. Do it. All right. This one's from Hans Apple. His question is, what do you think is the number one key to staff retention? Go ahead, Hedrick, you're up. You know you what? You get to go first. Oh, ladies first. Hey. Um, <laughs> you know what? I love this question because we have to look at it very differently than we used to. First of all, culture. I mean, yep. a team culture, school culture, uh, uh, you know, that sense of belonging, that belong, that that's huge. So that still has to be established. But I think right now you have to really look forward and hybrid teaching is not going away. We are not going to go back to some, the way it was. An element of what we've shifted to, what we've 
quote unquote pivoted to is not going to just suddenly dissipate. There are a lot of good things. Um, a lot of people may not want to send their kids back, especially over the next couple of years into classrooms with varying levels of immunity, herd immunity, this vaccine works, it doesn't work. It, you know, we're still learning so much. So I think in looking at those things, the one thing we have to look at is that teachers don't need an, another app. You know, when you talk to district level leaders, they talk about, let's get our, give our teachers some more training. We want them to have more training. What do you want training on? And I have yet to hear one teacher this year say, what I need is more training. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I need another app, you know, pick five and learn those. Cause you can basically, you don't need training. There are TikTok and YouTube videos on how to do everything. Yeah. What we need is time to rethink the concepts of how we're educating our kids. Yep. And that's where nobody's really looking. So if you want to really relieve your teachers, talk about streamlining systems. You know, if you have a power school and a Schoology and app for messaging and another app for uh, administrative things and getting your, your paychecks and putting it for major systems. So I think a big part of retention this year when I hear teachers, and I, I will say that I spend a lot of time talking people off the ledge because I'm mm -hmm. district lead and they call and they say, hey, you know, I'm considering, don't do it. And the things they mention is that everything is all over the place. They're just yeah. things everywhere. And so I think that if districts can really start to streamline systems so teachers have one or two places to go, not a training on this app and a training on this system and a training on this, on the, on this blackboard, you know, let's just pick something. When you talk about things like cognitive load or web design, mm -hmm. let's take those things off the plates of teachers. Let's give them a template. And so that all learner facing classes look like this and teachers don't have to make it up. I mean, I teach at tech. So for me, it wasn't a big pivot in the way I do things before a, a K-6 teacher who was doing worksheets and stations and manipulatives, they're lost. Yep. And you don't need, they don't need 16 more apps and training. They need to have a streamlined system, a one shop, like teach better. You know what I mean? You want your podcast? We got some of those. You want your blogs? We got some of those. You want some trainings? We got some of those. You want some courses? We got some of those. They do not have to go to 16 different places to look for things. Everything is, is housed in one place. So in the way that you guys have really put together an amazing system that supports teachers, districts need to look at doing, just putting together a, a, operative word, a system that supports teachers and not training us on 16 different things. Cause that's just, I'm just over it. Totally agree. And I think, you know, right at, right at the start there, uh, you know, Hedrick mentioned culture, I mean, which is always a thing, right? And and everything you talk about falls into that culture too, right? Because part of the culture now that we have to focus on and work to either rebuild, transform, however you want to phrase it, is the fact that everything has been all over the place and things have been, there's still so much uncertainty and there's still going to be, and, and Hedrick, I'm really glad you alluded to the fact that like, hey, yeah, things are looking up. Right. And things, you know, the shots are getting in arms and stuff like that. But like, we're still ways away from this thing. Right. And there's still very, we have no idea. Like we're still so much we don't know. So like that's going to continue to potentially be all over the place or potentially up and down and all around and stuff. So having that system, right. That's part of that culture. That's right? part of bringing them in. And I think that comes from like Hedrick mentioned, but she's like, I'm talking to people. I'm listening to people, right? You listen to your teachers, talk to them, ask them what they need. Don't assume you that they need, training on this or a new app or whatever, but also don't assume that they don't because maybe they do, right? Maybe they do, maybe they don't, but maybe they need very specific training on certain things and and figuring out like, but little, like, you know, have to touch with like the system, having one system, things like, hey, this is how things should work. And this is what you need to do. As long as you're doing that, you're okay. You don't have to do 5 billion things. That's all part of that culture. It's kind of, you know, we talk about meeting students where they are right now and being so important about that from a leadership standpoint, you need to meet your, your teachers where they are. Yep. And you have to start there, not by looking at what everyone else is doing, because all their teachers are where their teachers are. Your teachers are where your teachers are. So you need to talk to them, figure out where they're at and their, your community is at, and then give them what they need, not what you used to give them, or what you think they need. Talk to them and really assess their needs, really listen to that. And that will go a long way into building a culture of support that you 
maybe you used to be able to provide in different ways. Now you have to provide differently. Right. Yep. And so I think, I, I think listening that type of stuff, I think that's always a massive, massive part of culture anyway. So like, this is one of those things that needs to always happen, but right now, even more specifically, I think is really, really important. So yep. uh, basically I totally agree with Hedrick. Matt. I'm going to pull something out of what you just said, Jeff, because I think you hit on it is the support, right? Hedrick alluded to this is that teachers are feeling overwhelmed. They're feeling stressed. And then on top of that, we've got a lot of stressors out at home, not even within the building. And then teachers are working insane hours right now because they're doing both online and they're doing in person and they're doing all these additional things like uh, Hedrick was talking about, about learning new systems and having 15 billion different things that they've got to learn to create online learning. And so the support is what our administrators and our leaders need to do is to figure that out. You know, are, are, are the teachers mental health suffering if that's the case what are you providing to them to help them through this really really tough time because we all know that COVID has done a lot of things to our communities there's a long laundry list of things that are going on that teachers are having to deal with outside of school and then they're supposed to turn it off <laughs> come into the classroom and then perform and have you know the students do well on you know state assessments and all these other things that you know, we're having to still work through through a pandemic. So, you know, I want to give a shout out to um, Greg Moffitt. Like he's actually finding ways to bring in mental health experts and finding community colleges and colleges and bringing those folks into his school to help support the teachers. So if they're having mental health issues, instead of not addressing it and instead of shaming them or acting like it's, it doesn't exist, you know, he's bringing resources to his school to identify and you know, help them through that. So that's just one of many things that a lot of administrators are doing, but I think it's the support piece. What can we do to make sure that every person that comes in our building, we're giving them our attention, but then we're also finding their needs um, so that we can give them what they need in regards to resources. This one other thing too, Josh, I really want to mention that's missing. I think in that support thing, a lot of us are feeling expendable. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Because there is the learning gap to make up for. There right. are the standardized tests that are coming. There are, you know, we need quality education, face-to-face -face learning. And teachers are feeling like the expendable part of this, that we want your mental, we want to work on your mental health, but, you know, as long as you're taking care of the kids and as long as you're showing up, that, that has not felt good since last March. Yep. And that I'm hearing from colleagues across the country that it, we're just kind of the expendable piece. Well, you you have to you have to go to work. You know, you're essential. It's like, well, that's not kind of what we signed up for. You know what I mean? It's when you are a nurse, a doctor, a first responder, you know that that's an element of your job. And the biggest pivot has been that it's up to us to keep the economy running. Right. It's up to us to, to be in classrooms so the kids can get services like healthcare and, and special education services. And it's up to us to make sure that we're in the classrooms, regardless of whether we're taking care of our aging parents and our children who have health issues, right. we have to be in the classroom because the kids need to get meals. And that just does not feel good. Yep. So a big part of it is really what you're saying, that support that says, no, you are, you are a priority. Yep. You and your family are a priority, and we're not going to make you feel, feel guilty for making the decisions that are best for your family as well. I love that piece. Mm -hmm. And not making them feel guilty if they take a day off or, God forbid, they, you know, they need food or if they need other resources that we're finding that out, like Jeff said, and we're asking those important questions. You know, we're going in the classroom, not as an evaluation, but we're just there to, to ask them, how is their day? What do you need? What can we provide you? That will go so much farther with your staff and, and that will affect your retention. I promise you. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. You can find out more at teachbetter.com slash podcast. Now let's get back to the episode. Are we ready for question number two? Do it. All right. This one's from Lebronte Hoover, amazing educational leader. And his question is, as a leader, what steps need to occur to ensure every student feels that they belong on your campus? Hedrick, you want to go first again? I get dibs every time. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm kind of like all over this. Um, that's really what I do. I don't know if you know Eileen, her, her, her Journey to Belonging podcast. 
but we talked a few months ago and when you talk about equity and anti-racist work and racial justice and social justice issues and all of those things, what you're really talking about is culture and belonging. Mm -hmm. It's all about humanity and culture and belonging. And that is what, that's what you do. I mean, if we can strip away for people who are uncomfortable with shifts that make that easy, um, I simply say, just get to humanity. You know, the old golden rule stuff. You treat others like you want to be treated. I teach every kid like I want my kid to be treated. You know, that's, that's, I know that my kid is in school with some teacher and I want to be, I want to always feel like whatever I'm giving to these kids, I feel comfortable expecting that back from the universe. So really just, just really, uh, uh, same thing you were talking about about teachers, looking yeah. at kids, what do they need? And how can I make sure that, Every one of my kids feels a sense of belonging. I may not be able to get, to give you what you need, but I know where I can get you what you need. Let's see where we can go get it together. That kind of thing. And just really learning, getting to know your kids and, and differentiating learning is cute phrase, but it doesn't mean anything if you kind of, unless you start to get to know your kids and see what it is they need, what makes them bloom, what, what makes them blossom. Yep. I agree with all that. And, you know, getting to know, to know their culture, where they come from and, what their family's about and, and where, where they come from and what they come from and, and how they come from there, right. To understand that. And that's, you know, has made a good point about the differentiation. Like it's, it's, it's not just about differentiation and how they might prefer to learn. It's also differentiating and, and understanding like who they are as actual, as people, right. And how they, how the world has been to them or is to them or how they view the world. And, and I'll go, we've kind of repeated this a bunch of time, but listening, like so talking to them and then listening to them. And when you're, when you're trying to figure out, Hey, what do you need? How can I help you learn how, you know, how are you today? Like all those things are good, but if you're not listening, like, and like truly listening and utilizing it, it doesn't do anything. Right. You know, it's like my buddy, Dave Schmidt talks about like, you know, if you collect all the data in the world, it's great. If you don't do anything with it, what's the point? So it's the same thing here. So I think um, actually doing that. And then Hedrick hit on this when she talks about how she treats the kids in a way that she would expect her, her kid to be treated. So I think that goes in with you, you then actually have to care. It's really easy to say, I love all my students. But you got to really like put in the work to make sure that they know that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's harder um, with some than others because they might not feel love anywhere else. So they don't even know how to recognize it. Right. And you might think that your smile is enough because other people get that, but that kid just doesn't know how because he doesn't, he or she doesn't get love other places. You might have to work a little harder to make sure that they get that. Hey, when I tell you that I care about you, like I really do, mm -hmm. like I, I'm, I'm here for you and stuff. So I think it kind of goes into that. You really got to get to know them, listen to them, understand where they're coming from, and then just put in the work to really show them that you care. Yeah. For us, I think our biggest goal is just to make sure that every kid has a connection with an adult or someone that's on the campus. And so we, we put out a survey and we used to just do it with eighth graders. And this year we actually did it for the entire student body. And when that was one of the questions is, do you feel a deeper connection with someone in, in the building? And if that percentage is, thankfully it was a low percentage, but even so, if there's 10% of our students, well, what are we doing to, to change that? Because if they don't have a good relationship with at least one teacher on our campus, then we're doing a huge disservice to that child. Because as we all know, there's there's plenty of students that don't want to go to school. And if they don't have that connection, you know, that's, that's going to make that even more difficult. I was one growing up, I hated school, but I loved my art teacher <laughs> and she was amazing. And that was the whole reason I went to school, not to go and learn anything other than just to be in her class and to be in her presence. And, you know, every kid needs to have that opportunity to, to have a connection and, and to love being in the presence of at least one teacher. And so I think that's one huge piece. I think celebration too. Hedrick said it perfectly. I mean, we all are in schools that have diverse populations. How are we celebrating them? How do we how do we make them feel like they exist and that they come from an important place, an important culture, and that they're recognized? And so, you know, that's another piece in our school that we're trying to do a better job of, of, of making sure that we recognize every single kid um, at least once through, through the school year. Are you a super fan of the Aspire podcast? Well, now you can show off your support with the new Aspire swag featuring t-shirts, hoodies, and a variety of drinkware. You can find all your Aspire swag at teachbetter.com slash swag. Now let's get back to the podcast.
let's keep going. So we got Taylor Armstrong is our third question. And he asks, we talk so much about what leaders are not. What are your top three must-haves in a leader? Jeff, you go ahead and take You want me to go? Oh, man. Um, so we, we've already said this. But I'm going to say it again. Listen. I think a, a top, uh, something that absolutely you have to have, uh, a skill call, skill trait, whatever you want to call it, as a leader is you have to listen to your people. There's, there's not much, I mean, there's plenty worse, but in this particular world, there's not a whole lot worse, more frustrating as, as a, as a team member, as employee, be asked a question or uh, given an opportunity to voice a concern or share a suggestion or anything like that. And then to feel like it fell on deaf ears or it was just tossed to the side. That doesn't mean you could, you're, you should, or will be able to always take every suggestion and like that, whatever, but you need to make sure that you are actually listening to your teachers. We talked about this in the first question, right? Listening to them about what they need, what they, what you can do to support them, what they're hurting with. Um, but listening to them in general, I think is huge. I think that's that's one of the most important things as a, as a as a leader. I think accountability is huge as a leader. I think it's really really important to understand that everything's your fault when you're a leader, and that's okay. Like it's your job to take on the accountability. That doesn't mean you have to blame yourself and feel horrible about yourself, but it's your job to take on the accountability and to, to take that off your already stressed teachers if you can and to, to take responsibility for like if, if the culture is not right in your school, it's on you. Like you got to figure it out. I don't care if you got, you might have some, you know, some what are bad apples, whatever. It's your job to figure that out and either fix them or get them out. And easier said than done, I understand, but it's your job, right? If, if things aren't, if Josh, if that number is higher percentage than it needs to be, that's your responsibility as a leader. So accountability is huge. And then me, I think for me, the most important thing in any leader, and this goes school or anywhere in the world, the biggest thing as a leader that you have to understand and like truly take to heart is that not a single person on your staff works for you. You work for every single one of them. And it is your job to give them what they need. It is your job to make sure that they can do their job. It is not their job to get things done for you. It's not their job to make your life easier. It's your job to make their life easier so that they can do the work they need to do. So accountability, listen in and understand that you work for them. Those are my three that I can think of right now. Right. I think that I, I'm good with that. So then you have three more or do I add to his? Are we going for three a piece or? What are we doing? I, you know, if you have three more, great, but I will take a stamp. If you want to stamp any of those with a little Hedrick stamp, I'll take it. I would like to stamp the, um, go ahead and name them one more time. So, so, <laughs> accountability, not- accountability, listening, and then you work Service. for them. The listening Service. and you work for them. And I'm going to spin off one on, cause it's kind of accountability, but kind of different. Okay. I'm, going- I'm intrigued. I'm going to add transparency. Mm -hmm. Mm, It's accountability, but there's another little thing. What I I really hate is when you have admin, they're standing there and they're giving you some directive and they're stammering through it because you know they think it's a load of crap, but can I say load of crap on this? Apparently you can, you just said it twice. (laughs) (laughs) Very good. So they think it's real. They think it's just really a no go. But they they have to. They they from, you know, come from the top, and they're telling it to you, and they're not convinced at all. And so then everybody leaves the leaves leaves with this you know vote of non confidence, and you're just feeling bad about it. And I would really appreciate when those things come up, and they often do. I mean, you know, admin's really a difficult place because you are really kind of betwixt and between. Yep. And mm-hmm. that's why I like the thing that you said about you know your teachers are not working for you, you are working for them. And t- having that feeling means you're transparent and you say, listen, we as a campus, as a district, we've decided that this is what we're going to do. I would have cho- I would have made another choice, but it's not in my hands. So I really need you guys to just get behind me. We're gonna give it, we're gonna give it our best shot. It might be successful. We have no idea that it's going, we, we don't, we might think it's going to fail, but we really don't have any data on that yet. So I really need you guys to get behind me on this and we're going to give it our all. I would much rather that than to have those, those non-transparent interactions where they, you know, you get people talking around in circles and mm-hmm. talking about, it could be a very positive thing. And just, it's like, just, just stop, just, just really stop. <laughs> and everybody in the room knows that, they're not really being 
authentic. Yep. Yeah. So I would like to have, you know, transparency. So accountable transparency. How about that? I, I, yeah, I like it. I like that twist. That's good. All right. Instead of doing three brand new ones, I'll just add on like Hedrick did just, just one, which is compassion. And I, I think as a leader, not everything is black and white. Most things are in the gray. And mm -hmm. until you're in that leadership chair, most times everyone else wants it to be one way or another. And, and that just can't happen. And, you know, we have to make sure that we understand all the variables before we make a decision. And a lot of times that requires compassion um, with our students and with our parents and with our teachers. There are just so many other things. And a lot of times people don't understand what all is involved when a decision is made. Um, but if you do not have compassion, um, one, that's going to kill your culture. But two, you know, the people that need you the most will not get the right decision made for them. So um, I think you need to have that in everything that you do. I, I would definitely say compassion. That's a good one. All right, I'm going to throw one more on there. All right. Go for it, Gars. <laughs> just, uh, I, I was just, it's just popping to me like, is, is, and it kind of goes in with listening and it kind of goes in with compassion, but like, I mean, it kind of goes into another one of our earlier questions too. Like, understand your people, get to know your people because different people need different things in different ways. You can speak to someone, different things inspire and motivate different people different ways. And you got to understand your people so you can have the conversation with them the way that you need to. Yep. I never forget I, in a past life when I was running a restaurant, like we had one employee that everyone else thought needed fired. And I'm like, she's always awesome on my shifts. Like why on earth will we fire her? And they're like, well, she just this, 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 that. And I'm like, oh, like, well, what are you doing when you talk to her? And they're like, oh, well, just that. And then she snaps. I'm like, oh, I said, oh, that's a really easy fix. And they're like, what? I'm like, two positives. Then tell her what's wrong. She fixes it right away. And like two days later, like I'm, I'm having conversation with all the other leaders. They're like, it's nuts. I tell her that she did this good, this good. And then I just ripped her a new one and she just <laughs> fixed it. I'm like, yeah, because she gets beat down everywhere else in her life. Like, you know, come, came from a rough home or where her mom like just always told her that she was never going to be nothing and everything like that. And never, you know, her, her dad walked out when they were young and she had a, a an old brother who actually used to just berate her. She just had horrible self-esteem. I'm like, so when you come in with two negatives, she's done. Like you just destroyed her. Yep. But if you give her two positives, she's so high, nothing you could say can hurt her. And she's so confident. And when you did, I'm like, but that's different. Like you come at me, like just come at me with the negative, like bring me the criticism and I'm going to go on it. Cause I don't even need, I, but like you have to understand your people. And that was like a really like simplified version, I think, but understand those people. It's just like the kids, like you got to understand you can go to, you know, you can go to Timmy different than you can go to, you know, Johnny or whatever. Like there's different. You understand where they're coming from, how you need to say things. It's the same thing with your staff. Like got to understand like who they are, what their goals are, what they're trying to do, because you're going to motivate them differently. You're going to talk to them differently. You're going to provide them different support. So that kind of goes in with the listening, but yeah. And, and guess, with the compassion too, yeah, the compassion. like it all, it all combines in there. Yeah. Well, because That's like what spurred student, it was your compassion talk. When the student's running down the hallway and you berate them and you yell at them and you don't have a relationship with them, that's not having compassion, right? No. And, and what is the result? Most times the kid's going to come back at you, if not more so, and it's going to escalate, mm -hmm. right? So, and the yeah. same with the teacher, if you're trying to give feedback and you come at them in a harsh way. I mean, that's, that's not compassion. That's not understanding yeah. that there's probably something else going on at home um, that's affecting their job, right? So we need to make sure that we understand our staff and our students and our yeah. parents to, to get the best for our organization. I think that's spot on, Jeff. Can uh, can somebody play this episode for Ray? Because she usually just berates me. I need I need like <laughs> oh my god I need a little pick me up. You know. She's Wait, there, there's one final piece of that that we've got to also talk about too, and that's when you have leaders, especially campus level leaders you have to know your people. You know, it goes to what you were talking about, about Jeff, about working for them, that there are, so, there are only so many district level edicts that you can push through. And you gotta know, you gotta know if what's gonna shut your team down. I know for, for our campus, honestly, it was the mood meter. The, literally every PD, we had to do the mood meter and we would stand in like, different <laughs> y'all listening sorry well if you're listening you already know because my coach <laughs> no seriously my coach he loves me I, we have such a great relationship and i he would come and ask me tell me on the meter how you're feeling right now that was a check-in and that was what was required on the district level that was so not him this dude's from military so this is like <laughs> but he finally stopped doing it because my question would be well you mean before you came and interrupted my lesson or now or right. you know or, and same thing that it just didn't work for us. And I know that we've been pushing the SEL thing, but 
when we when asked teachers, if you're not feeling great, you know, oh, where are you on the mood meter? Everybody would head to the red corner because it was just it's it's a, it's the end of a long day. We're in PD and we're gonna have another data dive. How do you think we got? So you know, <laughs> try to find whatever that balance is to to not especially things like that. You know, there's some things you got to push through. I do understand that, but a thing like how you check in with your staff. That should really be motivated by your people mm-hmm. and how well you know them and what they need. Do they need two positives and a negative? Or do they really need to stand up and move around the room and stand in the blue zone, the green zone, the yellow zone, and the red zone? <laughs> that is just not your campus. <laughs> then, you know, yep. yeah. that's something you can let go without. I'm sure there's no data that's going to be taken and it's not going to mess up, you know, your, your standing as an administrator. Yeah. So, you know, if there's some little things that you, you see that it just doesn't work for your team, then have, have the courage to let that go. Yep. Yeah. And that's the difference between knowing your team and just grabbing something because it worked for someone else that you happen to admire. Yep. Like it's great. It might work for, great for them. It doesn't mean it's going to work for you. Like it's just, that's just how it is. And it's, it's okay. I love that. It's okay to let that go. Good stuff. So Jeff, I lied. I, I actually said that I had three questions, but I actually have a fourth. Okay. What's going on with the Teach Better team? Yeah, Teach Better team. Um, a, lot of, a lot of fun stuff coming up right now. I think the biggest thing, let's see, what can I pull from? We've got our Building the Grids, a live Building the Grid series right now going on. And that's going on for the next several weeks still. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is what it's kind of what it sounds like. It is live streamed every Tuesday night at eight o'clock Eastern time. Chad Ostrowski is uh, going live with another educator and building a grid live. I have a quick um, question. It, what's uh, up? I, as I understand, it's for, is it math specific or just for everybody, but, but based kind of around math? I wasn't sure. It's that. not around math at all, actually. No. Uh, it was actually, the grid math was actually created in the seventh grade science classroom. I thought um, that maybe he's just a math teacher. Is Chad a math teacher? Ray is a math teacher. Okay. Um, Chad, Chad was a, Chad was a science uh, teacher, uh, seventh grade science. Actually, we we have had grids run in every single grade level across every single subject matter, including in collegiate and more than seven different countries. So literally everything fits in it. I've literally never heard no when it's like hey does this work with because it aligns with every initiative you can imagine mm-hmm. um and you could fit any curriculum in it because it's not a curriculum it's not rigid mm-hmm. it's very flexible uh so it works with everything and so one of the cool things about the series i'm glad you you asked that because this these is that we've got a lot of different people we got we have uh elementary teachers we've got high school teachers middle school teachers they i think he's got a band uh band uh teacher on one of them there's a math there's gonna be a science gonna be a social study. like so he's got a variety of them and then the very last uh week He's got an admin coming in to do it from an admin right. side on, on the frequently stuff there. So, uh, and, it's, and it's one of our, our good friends, Mark Heller, who is a phenomenal admin who's got a school that runs the grid method amazingly. So it's gonna be a lot of fun. For me, you know, coming in, you know, when Chad and I started this, like that's what we did, you know, first three years, it was just me and Chad driving and flying all over the place doing grids. And like, that's how I learned how to, everything was, just watching Chad build grids with people. And then it quickly actually became one of my favorite things to do because I can't really dive into the curriculum very well because I've never been in the curriculum. But if you can explain to me what you're trying to teach a kid, I can help you grid it. And it was like one of my funnest moments, I think when when Ray like Ray like realized I wasn't a complete idiot and like that I knew a little <laughs> bit about the grid method. We were working with the school and I was at a table with all gym teachers, which is a little different with that. And I was breaking down how to grid basketball. And like how you could build a grid based on basketball and stuff like that. Like I love doing that, but more so I love, Ch- I love watching Chad do it. Cause he just yep. unlocks this creativity in the teacher. So anyway, that's going on. That's going to be great. We're actually going to house them all and put them in a co- free course as well too. So that'll be available afterwards, but, but it's live stream across, you know, on, on YouTube, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Twitch. So you'll be able to go watch them anytime on all of our safe videos. And then we have our March giveaway. So, our amazing social media team has come up, came up with this idea and I think they came up in January and they're like, Hey, we're going to do like a giveaway every single month and just give stuff away. And they're like, of course, Jeff will be okay with that. Cause he gives stuff away all the time. Anyways. I'm like, great. So they put together a bunch of packets. So every month it's about the second weekend in a month and it just goes for a couple of days. It's like really simple things that you have to do. And then you get entered to win a, a giveaway. So this is running between I think the 8th and the 11th of March. It's on Facebook. You just have to go there and share a post from uh, from the f- like the Facebook page, share a post, and just like tag us in the share, and that's how you enter. So it's really simple. Enter, and they're doing a swag like sort of like the the like the Teach Better logo swag packet. So it's a hoodie, t-shirt, and a 
and a coffee mug. So that's going on, but it's every month it's changing both on like the platform it's focused on the rule and how to enter and then what we're giving away. So like in January we did uh, an Academy membership plus like coffee with Ray and something else. I think an Amazon gift card in February, we're recording this like in the, at the end of February with six book giveaway. So a yeah. bunch of books that we had that, that were given away and stuff too. So uh, they got stuff going all year long. So it's gonna be fun. So that's, that's what I'm going on right now too. Awesome. I think we'll leave it at that. There's some other stuff, but we'll do another episode closer yeah. to things like the uh, <clears throat> 12 hour live stuff. Like we'll do that. We'll, we'll get to that later. <laughs> I can't believe you went there, but I'm so glad you did because I'm. I I'm went excited. there. Hey, you know, aspire people got to get a little, a little. They stuff. do get we, some insider information. Ray and I had already talked about it somewhere at some point, or at least at least hinted at it on the on Teach Better Talk at some point. So. Awesome, it's well, coming. It's definitely coming. So it's coming. Be, be aware of that event. But um, I'm so glad that you talked about the building a grid, and then of course the March giveaway. Hedrick, yeah. you are just amazing. Can I say that? You're fantastic, and I'm so happy that you joined us tonight and that you provide some amazing wisdom to our three folks that asked the leadership questions. Well, my pleasure. Shout out. Those are guys I actually meet, uh, meet out on in the Twitterverse, so I'm glad I could put a spin on some things that's helpful. So, Hedrick, you brought it up with Twitter, so how can they connect with you on social media? Oh, you know, the cool thing is, if you know how to spell my name, you can find me everywhere. It's H-E-D-R-E-I-T-H. So, at Hedrick on Twitter, Hedrick Nichols on Facebook, at Hedrick Nichols on Instagram, Hedrick Nichols on, uh, what's the name of that thing? Uh, uh, LinkedIn. <laughs> at Hedrick, that thing? LinkedIn, Hedrick, Anchor slash Hedrick, YouTube slash Hedrick. I'm serious. It's like, you know. Hedrick.com. Hedrick.com. Everywhere. If you can spell our name, you'll find her. Just Google it. <laughs> That's pretty much it. And I do this every time. I'm going to do it again. If you Google it, scroll down a little bit because you'll find her old music videos. I'm just like, you got to do it. I'm looking at We bonded, we, we bonded really early on about the history. Of, hey, if you didn't want to watch it, take them down. That's why go. they're still up there. It's good stuff. I know what I'm viewing tonight. <laughs> All right, Hedrick, Jeff, thank you so much for being on the Aspire podcast. Thank Josh, you, Josh, Jeff, thank you. It's been a pleasure.